Hello everyone and welcome to Warwick Anglican Parish. This is the sermon for Sunday the 25th of October 2020. Our focus readings today are Deuteronomy 34, 1-12, to the first letter to the Thessalonians 2, 1-13 to and Matthew's Gospel 22, 34-46. to In the name of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. When I was preparing for today, many of the artworks connected with the readings that I've just shared with you were public works of art, murals. Murals very often reflect the culture or the aspirations of a place or a people, and we tend, of course, toward positive themes. This one was my favourite. Coming up next, there it is. It's called Potluck Mural. The power of public art is something we've discussed in silo art and also on the streets of Tirana in Albania. And many examples explore ideas of love in action, peace in community, hope, tolerance, unity and reconciliation. Strangely enough, all this street art put me in mind of the first large scale collection of street art and murals that I had seen. This was very different. This was community art with a much darker story to tell, a story where love was lacking, where fear and hurt and prejudice ran high and where leadership and history compelled people to remember and remember and remember their devastating past and never to forgive. The artworks that will appear on the screen behind me are from the city of Belfast. I was 25 when I first travelled to Northern Ireland and I've been there a couple of times. I took the ferry across from Stranra to Dublin and after a few days I drove up to Belfast. While uh, there was a tenuous peace in place at the time, from the earliest moments of crossing the border I knew I was in a different land. The artwork began. Some of it very simple, red, white and blue painted on curb stones. And then there were the meeting halls of the orange men surrounded by very high fences and the odd surveillance camera. The closer to Belfast I got, the bigger and the more elaborate the murals became and the greater the political or religious statements. The checkpoints in the city at the time were unmanned in the relative peace, so I took the opportunity to walk unhindered around Belfast. I visited the Anglican Cathedral in the more prosperous city centre, and then, by sharp contrast, I visited the Roman Catholic Cathedral along toward West Belfast. It was a burnt shell of a church just opposite in my recollection. I took two photos then, one from inside Belfast's Anglican Cathedral and the other just down the way from the Roman Catholic Cathedral. Here they are. The spiritual gift of patience personified and the Madonna and the infant Jesus floating in a peaceful blue sky. To me, these artworks had a luminous beauty and seemed the very antithesis of the faceless warriors in balaclavas wielding rifles, the streets and buildings torn apart by bombs and tanks and a restless sea of hate. So how do you get from this to this? And what do you make of a community art that looks like this one? Prepared for peace, ready for war. Nothing particularly peaceful about that artwork. I'm in the process at the moment of reading a book called The Greats on Leadership. It's by Jocelyn Davis and Bishop Cam sent it out to parish priests in the region. One of its chapters talks about the leadership lessons we might draw from the life of Moses, interestingly enough, and we'll return to him in just a moment. But the chapter that struck me was one called Justice. As the writer unpacks the practice of justice, it becomes clear that an inflexible, rigorously applied version of justice, what's fair, what the rules allow for, who is owed what, and so on, can also lead to a rigid insistence on uniformity, conformity over unity, a totalitarian state over democracy. 
Justice as it happens is one of the two things we say characterises God. God is love, we say, and God is just. Both together. And this is important. Justice that is only understood through a narrow human lens might well result in the artworks that trumpet prepared for peace and ready for war. The leadership of Moses, though, and then in Christian scriptures, Jesus and St Paul show us eloquently that what actually transforms a community, a person, indeed our world, is the addition of love. A few weeks ago, you might remember, we reflected on the parable of the generous master. And this reminded us that God's justice prioritises an open-handed kindness over our ideas of what is fair. Now, this is not to say that Moses, Jesus and Paul didn't care about justice. They cared about it very much. But Jesus in particular was highly critical about a form of justice that followed the rules and was biased toward those who knew the rules or who lived lives that stayed within the boundaries of what was culturally normal or acceptable, untroubled in their own lives by any significant threat, illness, difference, disability, or bereavement. Jesus' idea of justice was one that was tempered with compassion and grace and forgiveness. The Gospel passage today is placed after Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem, at the start of what we now know as Holy Week, it's Matthew 21. Jesus is being tested at every turn by the Pharisees and the Sadducees, peppered with questions in the hopes that he will tangle himself up and make for easy discrediting or disposal. But with each challenge, his response shows that he is thinking very differently from what we might call those in the establishment. And yet, his radical notions of inclusive love and far-reaching grace are drawn from ancient and credible sources. The two great commandments attributed to Moses. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, Jesus says, and a second is like it. Love your neighbour as yourself. Time and again, the Gospels point us back to love. Love is what takes Jesus to the cross. Love is what keeps him there, asking God's forgiveness for those who have put him on it. The priority that he gave to love in action, love in community, self-giving and humble, was articulated beautifully in Paul's iconic letter to the Corinthians. Love is patient, love is kind. It is not arrogant or boastful or rude. Love, in other words, changes the picture. Paul's letter to the Thessalonians today is full of perspectives on what it is to be a godly person, indeed a godly leader. Paul says that he's not one to hide behind a mask and he speaks openly and with courage and honesty, persistence. He has a truth to tell of a God who loves the world so much that he gives to it his best gift, his son, not to judge it, but to save it. Paul reminds his listeners that he did not spend time among them to dominate them or to garner praise, but to care for them, delighting in the gospel and working hard in the community. This is the way that communities are changed, not through the arrogant demands of a distant leader, not by ambushing or annihilating someone you suppose might be your enemy in a, in a clever argument or a hail of bullets, but always through loving words and actions, lived and demonstrated. Jocelyn Davis reflects that the key to Moses' success was perhaps that he was very aware of his own failings. He didn't, at first, if you remember, want to be a leader, a spokesman. He was humble. Next, she observes, he went first. In other words, he demonstrated courage. He didn't ask others to do things that he wasn't prepared to do himself. He put God and people, rather than policies, first. Finally, he fostered 
and sustain hope in his community. Love changes the picture. Over the decades since I was there, Belfast has changed. The polemic between Catholic and Protestant no longer matters as much as it did. And in the main, people want a different future for their children. God is just and God is love. We cannot separate them. And if we do, we are bound to end up in a world where neither one of them is present. Jesus kept on saying, love God with everything you've got and love your neighbour as you love yourself. Because every picture we paint, every image we have of ourselves and the world we are blessed to inhabit depends on it. 